Yeah, um, that's, uh, it's a surprising <laughs> pleasure and a great pleasure for me to introduce Helen Varen to you. Um, uh, Helen is, uh, I think, a very fitting uh, keynote, actually, also after we heard Fervin Saar uh, elaborating on relational ethics or new ethics of relations, because she, in her work uh, as a philosopher of science and a sort of very important voice, I think, in post-colonial science and technology uh, studies, has emphasized sort of how we can start thinking from relations, but also from the moments of encounter um, and the sort of difficult moments of encounter. Um, and um, yeah, so, so it's a great pleasure to welcome her and to introduce her to you. Um, Helen has, uh, is from Australia and she has also done her PhD in Australia and then uh, I don't know in the 60s went to Nigeria 70s 80s 70s, <laughs> 70s? Uh, well, 80s, really. okay uh, okay in 1980, she went to Nigeria uh, where she helped sort of with the uh, development of the mathematics curriculum there and um, her for basic education, actually. And the book, uh, or that encounter, that uh, particular experience, uh, how to teach mathematics sort of in a Yoruba setting, um, has led to one of the really fascinating, or I mean, one of the great books uh, we have in STS, uh, Science and an African Logic, which was published in 2001 and awarded the Ludwig Fleck Award of the Society for Science and Technology Studies. And it's, a, it's really a book uh, that I would strongly recommend to everyone because, well, okay, I won't go into, <laughs> into all the <laughs> reasons <laughs> for that. Um, uh, and uh, sort of after that uh, stint in Nigeria, which I think was quite a while that you uh, that you uh, eight years, eight years so, uh, that you spent there, um, your work has centered on Australia and also sort of. Uh, scientific on or, or ways forms of uh, knowledge production between I could say indigenous uh, knowledges and uh, also scientific knowledges and uh, I mean you've done many uh, many things with that right and you've thought through uh, actually very carefully I think what these what these encounters mean and what it can mean also to sort of yeah, generate other forms of knowledges, uh, maybe have sort of small and modest interventions, not sort of to, uh, you know, to dismantle everything, which is probably not possible, but to start sort of from, uh, start from these uh, smaller encounters and difficulties, uh, what you've also then uh, aptly called, I think, a post-colonial post moments, um, uh, and also post-colonial moments in science studies. Um, you've also worked uh, in, in Europe, in Scandinavia, right? Uh, um, also around sort of, um, and there I think you've, you've, uh, you've encountered or you've begun also to think around these questions and matters of uh, colonial memories via visa or, or through objects and through sort of uh, narratives and through other kinds of narratives. Um, so, so that's also a very interesting avenue or journey that you've, that you've taken, I think. And uh, so your talk today around sort of the debates on the Ethnographic Museum and its collections uh, centers, I think, act, I mean, greatly around the question, uh, where is the rub between the polity and the Ethnographic Museum? So how do we also reach out from these discussions that focus sort of on the institution into wider politics? And we very much look forward to hearing you, Helen. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Katerina. And um, thank you uh, to the organizers for the invitation. I'm the third Auslander that, that speaks to you, uh, and I'm honored uh, that you think I have something to offer 
as you uh, in Germany through ethnographic collections begin to in a materially based way grapple uh, with the uh, with the colonial uh, past with with the post colonial and and what it means um, in this uh, post migrant uh, world so thank you and I before I begin I want to um, suggest that my talk should be imagined as situated within the politico-epistemic space that has been carved out by the Sar Savoir report of, of late last year. And I make a scholarly intervention, uh, or a scholarly offer, you might say, uh, that I hope may inform uh, what the authors of, those, of that report call uh, the next steps in a relational ethic. And, and how we enrich that, develop it, bring it to life in myriad particular situations because I think that is one of the things that's come out very clearly in the last few days, the particularities uh, and, and how uh, to really attend to those particularities and treat them as generative uh, situations, generatively, uh, epistemic and, and political and cultural uh, and uh, generative uh, in the sense of uh, just admitting that we love the objects uh, and, and using that passion. So um, my general claim uh, concerns the epistemic work of, of constituting that framing of a relational ethic. Um, and what I want to propose, and perhaps even insist, uh, is that, um, philosophically speaking, universalizing and relativizing, uh, of which the latter, there's been a lot uh, in, in this uh, conference, um, they're not the only options we have philosophically. Uh, and in fact, I think they're not the best options to attend to the particularities that need to be attended to here. So I'm making an ontological intervention and I'm arguing for the ont th that we need a framework that will allow us to know the ontological co-constitution of humans as knowers and the familiar objects that they know. That ontologically, these are co-constituted in the situation of the analysis. Uh, so I'm going to argue an evidence with stories a profound mutual co-constitution of human bodies uh, and object bodies. Uh, and with two stories, uh, I'm going to uh, claim that these stories uh, show this ontological reality. They show it uh, as a real. Um, and uh, it's a real, both in the institutions of modernity, of colonialism, uh, and in the logic, or in the logic of modern institutions, and in the logic of Papuan life. So the particularity that I'm attending to here uh, is uh, the particularity of <coughs> a Papuan setting. Papua, Papua was a colonial category um, th that became Papua, Papua New Guinea uh, on independence, or re really as, as part of colonialism. Uh, and uh, so I, I'm using a colonial category there. And uh, I think that's useful uh, because this was the category when the archives I'm talking about uh, came to life. It was in that 
uh, that these ethnographic objects were uh, conceptualized as ethnographic objects. Um, now, what I'm not doing is considering a general ontological question uh, of the animation of objects. Uh, there's been talk of that, uh, and uh, that, that's good. We do need to talk about that uh, general ontological position, but that's not what I'm doing here. And nor am I considering uh, that position which sees that objects are socialised uh, socialized as inanimate bodies and they take on. Uh, so uh, I, I, I just, this is what philosophers do. They're very good at telling you what they're not doing. Um, so uh, excuse me. So it's an ontological claim and it's made within a material semiotic monism. Now this is a fairly unusual, if not uh, up to this point completely absent uh, as a, uh, an analytic framing in museum studies. But, but here I'm trying to give it birth. Um, <coughs> and uh, as I said, the particularity that we're attending to is Papua. Um, and we need to know how to attend to those particularities. And as my title implies, uh, I'm concerned with governance in a modern polity uh, and the connections between governance in a modern polity and ethnographic objects. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not a topic that springs to mind immediately, but I, I think it's quite important. Um, and the two stories I'll tell both, uh, well, they're um, in a way episodes of one story and they straddle the colonial, post-colonial temporal boundary uh, in uh, uh, Gulf province, which is a particular uh, area of post-colonial Papua New Guinea. And uh, my claim is that in both stories, uh, connections between the, a modern polity and an ethnographic uh, collection, um, rather than particular objects, um, reveals a profound mutual implication of human bodies and object bodies. And when we accept uh, the ontological or, or the ontic actuality of this claim, uh, of, of this profound mutual entanglement, um, then we, we have a base, a platform, if you like, to respect and expect uh, the affective load uh, that uh, objects in an ethnographic uh, collection carry. Uh, th this well, this comes as a surprise in both universalizing and relativizing uh, in the framework that I'm just beginning to uh, develop here. Uh, it's what you expect. Uh, you know, why should it be otherwise? Now, I'm old enough to have had participated uh, in the governance of uh, uh, Papua New Guinea in the colonial era. Uh, in, in fact, the very first job I had uh, in a university vacation uh, was as a, uh, a colonial um, rural uh, development officer. Uh, I was 19 at the time, uh, and uh, at that time in Australia, I was still a child, um, but that's another story. Um, I, ju I just want to, um, by, by telling you that, I want to um, let you know how implicated the lives of many Australians are uh, in Papua New Guinea, uh, both in the past and in the present. For um, uh, Papua and Australia are closer than Cologne and Paris. Um, and so it's not surprising that my own family's present is deeply implicated 
uh, in Gulf province. So uh, in the past, uh, the entanglements of Australia and Papua New Guinea uh, run very deep. Um, story one comes from my reading of an archive, really, uh, and story two has an, a, a, an ethnographic element uh, and a reading of the secondary literature. Now, story one, I've given the title uh, The Official Papuan Collection. Now, this is the... I told a story of this collection in the blog, uh, in my post on the blog. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm using that story uh, in the blog, but in the blog I'm doing something different with the story. That is the wonderful thing about uh, this form of what I call empirical uh, epistemology or empirical philosophy. Uh, you can use stories to do all sorts of things. In the blog, uh, what I'm trying to draw attention to uh, is uh, what's involved in conceptualising the ethnographic object uh, and uh, what's involved in working uh, with uh, and the changes uh, that that ethnographic object uh, both undergoes and induces in, in the ongoing happening uh, of uh, the, the um, colonial, or now post-colonial archive, really. And in this story, <coughs> a colonial official amasses a rather small ethnographic collection uh, an official uh, colonial um, collection of ethnographic objects. They're everyday objects. There's very few uh, that are interesting, uh, either in an art market or in anthropological theory. Um, and it's no doubt uh, that these objects collected uh, in the work of governance uh, were uh, collected in exchanges that were probably totally mysterious to one side of that um, uh, exchange. Uh, the, the villagers whose everyday objects were um, coercively and no doubt in unequal negotiations um, requested by government patrol officers. Um, uh, I have a, I suspect that uh, the people who gave up these objects, probably objects that were, um, you know, they didn't care much about, um, but they had deep suspicions that these were going to be used in sorcery. Um, so they probably chose the objects uh, quite carefully, I suspect. Um, and uh, th this story th begins in governance and uh, shows and, and then turns to an ethnographic collection. Um, and uh, it, uh, the ethnographic collection is made by the government, the government uh, on the basis that uh, anthropology can help the Australian uh, colonial government uh, do better government. Um, so um, I'll come back to this. Um, so that's the official Papuan collection. That's the title. The title of my second story is called uh, The Vailala Madness. Now this is a uh, term that's uh, found in the Australian anthropological literature. Uh, and, and the anthropological literature very uh, generally. Uh, it's uh, much discussed, uh, a, a wonderful, <coughs> seen as a wonderful case in the history of anthropology uh, and uh, for many other reasons. Uh, the, uh, anthropology has negotiated uh, the problems of structuralism and functionalism through this episode that has been much talked about. Um, I'm uh, going to use it in a way that's completely different. 
uh, than it's been used uh, before. Uh, and it's really about, from my point of view, it's about objects that didn't uh, make it in to any ethnographic uh, collection uh, because uh, the people who had formerly revered uh, many of the objects um, may, took it upon themselves to destroy them. They uh, felt that their efficacy uh, was now uh, in doubt. Uh, so so th this is, a, is an absence, if you like, uh, in, in the colonial archive. But, but this story starts with uh, a contemporary intervention in governance uh, and then uh, discovers this uh, absence uh, in the um, archive. Uh, and but but then things become quite interesting. Um, so my my first story, uh, a colonial official amasses a, a large number of everyday objects uh, in exchanges that are uh, become it's part of the instructions that uh, patrol officers are given, that they should in all cases endeavour uh, to uh, bring, bring back uh, objects, every, everyday objects or valued objects uh, for the uh, official collection uh, and, and the justification for having this as a, an instruction uh, to government officers uh, is that uh, it will that anthropology uh, is part of the Australian government uh, rule here, and there is an, a, a government anthropologist. Now, the government anthropologist doesn't always agree uh, with the governor, uh, who also has an interest in in anthropology. Uh, but anthropology is very much and explicitly uh, part of uh, the governing apparatus in, in, in Australia's administration. Um, now, uh, th so these are brought back to Port Moresby, which is the colonial capital and is now the capital of Papua New Guinea. Uh, and but there's no uh, ethnographic museum, or, uh, although the governor um, does get permission to build an ethnographic mu museum, it never actually happens. Uh, and these objects get deposited in a storeroom in Port Moresby. They're rarely visited. Uh, occasionally, visiting uh, international anthropologists. Uh, get access, and of course, this is a highly anthropolo anth uh, anthropologists are very interested in, in Papua New Guinea, and they're very thick on the ground, uh, and it, and so they're the main users of this depot uh, of, of objects. Uh, I don't think they ever added much uh, to the policies. That, that were uh, developed and, and uh, I implemented in Papua New Guinea. But, but clearly uh, they're there, and they're there in increasing amounts between about 1907 and 1933. Uh, they're 3,000 at, at the end of 1933. So, you know, this is not a vast collecting enterprise. Um, and uh, the, the whole point, I mean, the, the justification is that these objects will speak of the places they come from. Uh, in philosophically, you say that they are indexes. They, they index, they connect to um, uh, particular times and places. And most of these objects have pretty good Provenance. I mean, these are government officers. They generally do what they're told, uh, and so um, th and they are collected as indexes, and that's all they're meant to do. Uh, there is a hope that one day they may inform 
the truth about uh, anthropological theory, um, but that's not a primary uh, justification for the collection of this, uh, for, for the, the, the um, amassing of the, this collection. Uh, so, um, if you like, the government feels that uh, though it can speak to very few of the villagers who constitute the uh, um, colonial um, citizens uh, of um, Papua New Guinea, um, these objects will speak for them. So uh, what I want to suggest to you is that as they accumulate, as this set of indexes in a depot in uh, Port Moresby, uh, I want to remind you of the uh, exhibition that uh, Peter Vibel and Bruno Latour made in Karlsruhe in 2002, uh, where they um, proposed, or, or part of what was proposed was this idea of a parliament of things. So uh, what I want to suggest to you that this depot uh, can be understood as a parliament of things. Uh, they don't worry to learn the languages and speak uh, with uh, the, the many uh, language groups that they're um, uh, administering. Uh, they much prefer to speak to objects or to uh, they're convinced they have ways of making objects speak to them. So, uh, in a way, this is my first little surprising assumption that um, the bodies of objects can be made to speak. They can be made to speak on uh, and speak truly of the people places that they come from. Um, so, uh, the, uh, in a way, the village's suspicion that these uh, objects will be interrogated uh, to get information about them uh, so that they can be uh, manipulated. Um, you know, it's not far from the actuality of what happens. Um, but um, unfortunately, the objects get very few chances to speak as it happens. Um, and before people do really learn to uh, work this uh, parliament of things, before the, the government officials really learn how to make them speak the truth, uh, well, there's already a parliament house, an actual parliament house, where people who are representatives of those people, places that were formerly represented by objects are now represented by members of parliament. So at the moment, the, the parliament house uh, opens in Port Moresby. This parliament of objects uh, is redundant. It reminds me of uh, uh, Malangan um, carving. The, the moment uh, the person is buried, the carving uh, no longer um, has uh, any role. It's just left to rot away uh, in the bush. Well, the collection was left to, was moved to Canberra and left to rot away where it is still uh, not literally rotting away. I mean, you know, this is what museums do. Um, but... Um, um, in, a, in not materially rotting away, but semiotically uh, uh, rotting away. So th this is my uh, first um, example uh, by which I, I want you to look at in a particular way and see, oh yes, uh, modernity does work by assuming that bodies of objects and bodies of in this case, collective people uh, are deeply entangled with each other. Um, okay, so uh, my next story, uh, which I call the uh, Vailala Madness because it's an anthropological term, 
uh, it uh, originated in my uh, being an interested observer, really, uh, to an episode that occurred in Gulf Province j just a year or so ago. And it began with the idea of a young woman who uh, is qualified as a community arts practitioner. She has a fine arts degree and uh, has worked in community arts in Australia. Uh, she's a child of the uh, uh, diaspora. She's been her grandfather, her, uh, her father is Australian, her mother is uh, um, from a village in um, Gulf Province, right on the coast, uh, although her mother grew up in Port Moresby. Um, and uh, as is quite common in Melanesia, uh, it's the, the mother's father who really has a, a possibility for adjudicating uh, where children are uh, reared wh and with whom, which part of the family. And uh, it was he who uh, deemed that this child should be raised uh, in Australia. So she's an Australian citizen, uh, but her, uh, she has a village, uh, a village on the coast of uh, Gulf Province, right on the coast. Uh, and this is a village that, like many of the villages along Gulf Province coast, um, is under um, very uh, evident threat from the rising levels of the Torres Strait uh, with uh, climate change. So increasingly, the uh, sweet potato patches are becoming uh, uncultivated. Uh, you can't cultivate them anymore because you know, the high tides are, are more common. Uh, and it seems that possibly even within a few years, the whole village will need to be evacuated. So uh, as a uh, community arts intervention, uh, the, the young woman uh, of the diaspora um, has an idea that, uh, well, uh, maybe, you know, we, uh, an arts intervention uh, here would, would be a good thing. Uh, and so she's, uh, she's in the village and, she's and she uh, goes to an older relative, a senior woman, uh, and uh, proposes, well, w why don't we find some uh, things in the ethnographic museums uh, and we make digital copies here and we bring them back and we discuss them. And so this is becomes a focus by which the community can remember its cultural resources. Uh, and this is happening a, a lot in Australia. It's a very, um, you know, it, it's not a pipe dream. The, these, um, these projects are funded uh, and have been now for a few years. Um, and uh, so she's negotiating this in English with this senior woman, uh, and the senior woman, you know, uh, said, no, it's not going to work, uh, and the reason is not that people are not interested or too busy, although that, that's probably, they probably are, that's probably correct. The reason she gives is there's nothing in the archive my grandfather's burnt it all. Uh, and uh, she goes on to tell a joke. And I will have to... Um um, <coughs> and uh, so... Uh, Uh, the, the joke goes like this, and I've also written about this joke elsewhere, um, uh, that in the early 20th century, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the ancestors of the senior woman and, uh, and the young woman, uh, they <coughs> uh, killed and ate uh, several sets of missionaries. Uh, and, of course, the uh, in inhabitants of Gulf Province these days find this abhorrent. Uh, but the point of the joke, uh, the joke goes like this. So uh, we, we, as 
uh, our ancestors as villagers, they ate the word. They ate the word of God. Uh, they took the word of God into their bodies materially more than any other group in Papua New Guinea. And what this does is make this group virtuous. So uh, we, we can see that our ancestors had a plan. They made us uh, virtuous by the fact that they have eaten the word of God uh, and uh, she roars laughing. Uh, she knows it's a joke. Um, and uh, what I'm suggesting is that this, uh, the logic of the joke uh, is a common logic uh, in Papua New Guinea. Marilyn Strathern writes a lot about it. Uh, she finds it amongst Haganers. And, and it's a logic uh, that finds that knowledge is generated in serial eversion, the serial pulling out of something that is inside. Um, and uh, so this is the logic of the joke uh, that the villagers uh, have the resource of pulling out something that is inside them uh, a particular um, a particular connection with virtue. Now um, <coughs> the uh, to, to switch from that ethnographic situation. Now to the, uh, what is called uh, there, uh, not, not, the, not that this senior woman connected it, uh, it's me who's made the connection, uh, with what's called the gulf cover cover, uh, and, or the Vilala madness. Uh, and um, this uh, story is another story uh, exemplifying the same logic, which was actually the logic that I attributed to the government officers, although they didn't know they were using that, that logic. Um, but, but I, looking at what they did later, I can see, oh, they're using that logic too. Uh, and so this is a, another example of it. Um, the uh, Vailala Madness takes its name from the Vailala River, which is northeast, no, northwest, sorry, of the village where I've just talked about. Uh, it flows from the southern highlands into the Torres Strait. Uh, and the so called madness spread from that region. Uh, ep and, and was dotted uh, throughout um, uh, Gulf Province in, in the third decade of the 20th century. Uh, and um, it, it's a phenomenon uh, that, um, you know, might be called hysteria, uh, or there's all sorts of pathological terms uh, it's given. Uh, and um, so now I need the slide uh, if those who are in charge. Okay, there it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so excuse the technology. <laughs> uh, this is a uh, um, report that has been made by the uh, government anthropologist, his name is Williams, uh, and he writes uh, that a young man, uh, Kaora, a fine physique and, uh, and appearance, uh, was displeased. Sort of hit, so he's visiting Vailala. Um, uh, and uh, he's displeased because uh, myself and others uh, have entered the Ahia Uvi without consulting him. And he's pours forth a volume of gibberish which contained a good many pidgin English phrases but was unintelligible, was intelligible to nobody. And when this was finished, he stood aside, stuttering and muttering, teeth chattering. 
He made a few symmetrical gestures with both hands, but for the most part he motioned with his right hand uh, just in front of his solar plexus as if he was trying to encourage his stomach to rise. Um, and meanwhile, uh, he heaved long sighs <gasps> and looked genuinely distracted. Um, and finally, he moved across to the flagpole and stamped around it and round it, shouting phrases like, hurry up, what's the matter? Come on, boy. Uh, many people watched Kaora uh, closely and it seemed with a touch of fascination. So this is... This is how uh, the gulf, cover, cover, manifests itself in this sort of behaviour. It was a, quite a common uh, form of behaviour. Uh, in, starting in 1919, uh, and uh, it went along with burning the masks uh, of ancestors, which had formerly been highly revered in, in the villages. So. Um, uh, th this, you know, is quite a famous uh, episode in Australia's governance. Uh, these are the masks uh, that um, were, were burned. The, the, uh, the, these were pictures uh, taken by the anthropologist or uh, th these never seem to have got into uh, the collection uh, that the uh, governor was making. Uh, but um, I, a lot of people, a lot of anthropologists who've looked at this, looked at the descriptions of the behaviour uh, and, and looked at the masks, have m made the point that um, the... Uh, the, the Papua names, the pigeon names for this uh, experience or this phenomenon uh, are called uh, head he go round uh, or belly don't know. Uh, in other words, don't know what the belly is doing, but heads going round. Um, and the most convincing explanation that I've seen in the literature uh, I is that um, it, what is being experienced is this profound association of stomach, which is the soul, uh, and the eyes, and somehow this embodied... So, so the people have actually become embodied as the masks. The masks are no longer seen as, uh, as efficacious, uh, in, in intervening in making a good life for the villagers uh, and um, quite large numbers of people become themselves, become living versions of, of the masks. So uh, th they're living versions of the ancestors. Now, um, the uh, and, th and this is quite widespread and quite... Uh, um, it lasts for, you know, 10 years, really. Uh, and quite large numbers of people are involved over quite a large area. Now, the government anthropologist, Williams, is very, very worried. Uh, he wants some government intervention uh, to stop this happening. He's very worried that the uh, people are building, are burning the very cultural resources that they need to cope with the uh, tremendous social change that has been thrust upon them uh, by the fact of colonialism, uh, where life in the village is, has been changed. Uh, I mean, we think we uh, experience change, but I think... Uh, uh, the, circum the change in circumstances of those people in Papua at that time uh, is it, very hard to imagine. Now, so the, the anthropologist is very worried. Uh, the government uh, governor uh, is not very worried. Um, 
he writes that he thinks it's rather a reasonable response uh, to uh, the social change that, that uh, is happening and the feeling of impotence. So um, it's a bit unclear as to what the government response is. One, uh, one source will claim that uh, the ringleaders were rounded up and imprisoned. Um, others maintained that all the government wanted to ensure is that none of the people who uh, suffered this syndrome or experienced this phenomenon actually t uh, were appointed in the role of village constable, uh, which he was busy doing these days. So he, he, was, he had no interest in disciplining, uh, but he didn't want uh, such a person who made such an experience uh, running the constabulary, constabulary, I can't say the word, excuse me, uh, in, in the village. So um, wh what I'm suggesting is that uh, this is uh, another story where we see, uh, or another phenomenon where we see this deep, uh, co-constitution of human bodies and object bodies uh, and uh, that, um, you know, it, it's an ontological actuality uh, and that uh, governance, uh, it's absolutely crucial in governance, I even uh, of me being governed as a citizen uh, in uh, Australia today. Uh, that this co-constitution of my body uh, as disciplined by the government, uh, by the state, uh, and as um, ruler, <laughs> because I'm a citizen who elects, uh, and all, all the technologies and the things that, are, uh, that connects me as citizen in these two ways to the state uh, imply also the, the deep co-constitution of, of human bodies and things. So, so m my claim is that governance relies on this ontological actuality, but philosophy has somehow managed not to notice it. Uh, or it, it's very clear why philosophy m fails to notice it uh, in um, if you're using a relativizing or a universalizing framing. Uh, so my suggestion is that wouldn't it be quite a good idea uh, if we did acknowledge this as an actuality and tried to work out uh, what a useful analytic frame would be and learn to use an analytic frame that will allow us to mobilise uh, that insight that these stories have given. So, uh, in concluding, uh, I'm, uh, the title of my talk was The Polity and the Ethnographic Museum. Uh, where's the rub? And the rub is this rough patch. Where, 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 does, it, where, where does it hook up and, and get... Uh, connected, um, where is it likely to be thrown off course? And we've, th we've seen this connection thrown off course in several of my stories. Uh, and uh, so my answer is, well, uh, the rub is in the ontological relationality that is the ontic uh, state uh, of that's implied in governance. Uh, so th th this mutual material, uh, material uh, semiotic uh, that governed objects, governed bodies are. So, um, that, so my, my claim is that governance is this vague whole uh, that involves uh, ontologically co-constituted uh, human bodies and object bodies. And I think if we 
can be, I think that's a very useful uh, analytic framing to begin to look at the actual epistemic practices that are going to be useful uh, in decolonizing uh, ethnographic museums. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Helen. So we do have, thanks for this talk and uh, for sort of taking us also uh, onto another realm, so to speak, to think around uh, what objects can be and also maybe, I mean, what they have been, but also what they can be perhaps in other, yeah, yeah. other circulations. So I'm happy to open the floor and I've seen a hand there. <laughs> Yes, microphone is coming. Yes, it's coming. Thank you. Um, thanks for this very interesting talk, Helen. Um, so I understand you are saying that uh, governmentality is the mode in which modernity works. So you're giving us this against the grain understanding of modernity and the co-constitution of subject-object, which basically goes against the ideology of modernity itself, right? Um, and basically, this is, uh, your approach is very appealing to me because you're going through the implementation of the idea of modernity, right? But what about the texts we have in which modernity and the self-narrative of modernity insist that it can divide the subject and object? Isn't that a practice in itself? It, it is. Yeah. It, it's a practice in itself, um, but we can choose to not adopt those practices. Yes. Yep. Uh, they're not given, that's the point. Um, they're constituted in practices. Now, uh, neither universalists, well, universalists are certainly very unhappy with, with this claim that their practices and they're constituted. There's no doubt. Uh, and so it may be that, you, you know, really, Kant, for example, would not be very pleased uh, to be uh, that this was a, um, that it's not a given. He, he finds it as a given, and, and some universalists today do too. Uh, people who do a relativizing, who see that the co-constitution was done in past linguistic, uh, cultural practices, but it's set in concrete now, they're more open. Um, but, but this refuses both those positions uh, and insists it can work quite well with both those positions. So uh, it's, it's this, if you want it to, to, to be incommensurable with universalizing and relativizing, you can make it, uh, but probably best not to. Uh, that uh, commensurability is constituted in the time and place of the analysis as much as anything else. 